and this is a bit like my local church on a Sunday evening, with the added bonus that you're not going to be asked to sing. Uh, so my background is, I'm, I'm a paediatric physiotherapist by background, and I've worked in acute and, and community settings over the years. Now, to me, that's a real advantage because it means that that I know what it's like being on the other end of my service. So I now manage an acute service, which is an integrated acute and community service, but I know what it's like to receive reports from acute services. And equally, I know what my team have to deliver in order to get children back into the community. So I'm a paediatric physiotherapist and I manage OTs and dietitians and occupational therapists. And Imperial College is, well I'm based at St Mary's, Imperial College is, you probably will know, the merger of Charing Cross and the Hammersmith with St Mary's, paediatric services at St Mary's, and our academic partner is Imperial College. Hence we then become this academic health science centre. So our services are based at, at St Mary's, and as you've heard this morning, that's number four for London's trauma centres. And paediatric trauma is going to be bolted onto that in the short term, and we don't know about the long term. But given that we've got a PICU and a paediatric a and &E and adult trauma, we're very hopeful that we will get paediatric trauma as well. Uh, so what's a good quality service? Well, I'm reluctant to call ourselves a centre of excellence because we don't actually have much of a track record of it yet. We have trauma because of those things I've said before, PICU, a and &E, and District General Hospital sort of trauma. So what I consider to be good quality is having a good, well-managed, cohesive service. And there are a few things that I thought actually pull that together. So, for example, leadership. Um, I think leadership plays the role because it facilitates best practice. So it enables flair and innovation within teams. And it's also mindful of resources. And that's quite a big thing at this time, politically this time. Resourcefulness. Um, None of us can be experts at everything in small services, and we are a relatively small service, and paediatrics is relatively small. We can't be experts at everything, we have to know a man who can. So we need to be able to access the expertise and have those good communications, good contacts, make sure that we, we can use other people's experience. We need to have a shared purpose. Um, I think that, that when the therapists work together, when they actually have a, um, one base and they work out of one base, it means they're co-located. It means that they go up to the wards together and they say, OK, what is there to be done? Who's going to do it? Um, and, and what have we got today and what can we wait till tomorrow? I've also added in there guarded compassion because I think that's something you have to worry about when you manage a therapy service on that basis of too close isn't really very helpful for families. Um, the other thing that we need to do is to be seen by the medical teams and by the nursing teams as an established workforce on the ward. You can't afford to have territorial professionalism and one of the first things I did when I started managing this service, it was new to us to have um, combined services managed by one therapist. One of the first things I did was to say to the occupational therapist they needed to go back into uniform and they needed to be up on the ward. It was bad enough that people didn't know what they did. If they didn't know who they were, it was even worse. Um, and then the other thing that links up is the access to specialist skills. So if you haven't got immediate access to things like splinting materials, innovative splinting materials, new things to use, alternative and augmentative communication. You need to be able to access them. You need to have the systems in place that enable you to buy in what you haven't got. And the key message out of that is that learning quadrant that came up this morning, which is you need to be in a place where you know what you don't know. <laughs> 
So the sort of pathways that we're looking at from acute services are either to be able to get people straight, children straight home, back to their local hospital or to rehab centres. But what I'm going to talk about today are the routes on those arrows. The importance of therapy involvement in acquired brain injury is well documented. It's about respiratory care, sensory stimulation, assessment of communication, maintenance of joint range, um, soft tissue, main, um, uh, preventing soft tissue injury, uh, soft tissue shortening and splinting and um, serial casting. But after that early stage, it's not very well documented about the relevance of our intervention in the very early stages. There was a, a, a literature search done, I think it was an American literature search, um, which just found that there wasn't any literature to substantiate therapies, intervention in the early stages of rehabilitation. Now, to me, that doesn't make any sense because if you've got a long pathway of rehabilitation, surely common sense is going to tell you you've got to get in there early to start some intervention. I think probably what it tells us is that there just isn't good research, that people aren't actually going back and looking at things. So it's not really very clever to say there's no documented evidence, there's just there's no research. What we do know is that three years on, after traumatic injury, the family's ability to cope is influenced by the care and the joint working that they had in the early days. And that's just circumstantial evidence. Physical disability is much easier to address. If we think about traumatic amputation, multiple fractures, they need healing, joint range movement, soft tissue mobility, limb fitting, mobility aids. So what is rehabilitation? Well, I suppose we could start by thinking, where does it happen? And the easiest thing that slips off the tongue is, well, it happens throughout the day, integrated into the whole, whatever the child is doing, personal care, play, school, home, therapy time all enabled by some shared joint goal setting between the therapy team and the, and the child and the family. And everyone has the same purpose. But actually, that's a rehab centre. And that's not the same as talking about rehab in the acute setting. Rehabilitation is a really tricky word to use in an acute trust. Acute trusts and trust management consider that rehabilitation is something that happens outside of an acute setting. As far as they're concerned, acute setting, medical management, shift them off somewhere else. But for therapists, rehabilitation is a very easy word to use. It, for us, it's just what you do from the moment of admission until to facilitate discharge. Now, if anyone's got an idea, we sit around very often when we're trying to do business plans saying, they don't like rehabilitation, what are we going to use? And no one's come up with a word that will replace that. But for me, rehabilitation starts day one, probably in a &E. What we do know, the main considerations for children, is the need for growth and learning to continue. So we need to get children back into a learning environment, home, nursery, school, and that means that you've got to have early identification of the likely outcome and their likely needs. So, for example, what's needed to access the school curriculum? Is it going to be equipment? Is it a modified curriculum? Do they need some one-to-one -one help in the classroom? Do they need one-to-one -one help in PE? Do they need assistive devices? Could it be simple as a walking aid or a wheelchair? So the very big message, the key message around rehabilitation is that it happens in the context of the child and their family. It happens in the context of their growth, their development, their learning and their play. And the overriding needs are to return the child to a learning environment. So we need a holistic approach, an acknowledged interdependency of all the agencies that are going to be involved with the child and the family. And that constitutes a team around the child. Children's needs are much more complex than the needs of an adult. And it's often much, much more difficult to engage the child and the family 
especially when you think of the family and the context that their loss is around what might have been when their child's got a, a, a long-term disability as a result of traumatic injury. And what we also have is the knowledge that young adults live for the moment. They're invincible. They like speed, they like thrills. When you add that into the young child scenario where they aren't able to, to think to themselves or aren't able to learn, we're doing this now because in six months' time it will enable us to do this. All that makes the rehab child much, much more complicated. Just wanted to do a bit of a side issue on play. When, when people see therapists on the ward in other community settings, social settings with children, what they tend to see is that we play with children. And what you do with children is use play as the medium. The medium, it's the medium that they learn, and so it's the medium, it's the catalyst for your intervention. The problem is that psychologists will often tell you that you shouldn't use play if the intervention that you have is painful. So that if you're doing something repetitively that is associated with pain and discomfort and you associate it with play, then it's poor for, for the child's psychology. I've got a little bit of a problem with that, um, but I can see their point of view. The other thing is that if you use play, if you're not careful, then the child associates the play as being the most important part. And you need to be able to say to the child, we're going to play, but we're going to work as well. It's a bit like being in a school environment, really. So, oh, I've got to my case study too soon. I won't do the case study just yet. So lots and lots is written about acquired brain injury and its rehabilitation. And you all know what the common causes are of that. Um, and we all know that it's often more devastating for children because of the developmental stage that it happens. So we know that those emerging developmental skills are affected differently from established skills when there's acquired um, brain injury or, or actually any other trauma. The best example of that is probably higher level reasoning and the social interaction and interpersonal skills that are required in older children and adolescents. And we know that they're frontal lobe activities, and we know that the frontal lobe develops later. And so when you have an injury in younger children that impacts on the frontal lobe, you might not actually see the true impact of that until much, much later. An awful lot's been written about the intervention of therapies in, in acquired brain injury. And so I decided to take a case study that looked about our involvement in a, in, a different, in a different child. So I've taken the bill, I've caught him the bill, not his real name. He's um, aged five years. He was born in the UK and his parents are of Algerian descent. And the family had lived in Scotland for many years. Um, Dad got a job in London and the family planned to move. Um, so Dad came down and started his job in London but he, um, he was living in bed and breakfast accommodation until they managed to get a, a house transfer from Glasgow. Um, the family visited Dad over Christmas, and in returning to Scotland, they were involved in very, very serious coach accident, one that I, you may very well remember. It happened on the slip road between the, uh, the M4 and the M25 after Christmas one year. So the bill was found outside of the coach, he had been intubated at the accident scene. He had major injuries, um, traumatic amputation, transradial transra um, amputation of his left arm and below knee amputation of his left leg. His mother also had a below knee amputation and his baby sister did too. So this family were devastated. Um, but he had no chest injuries, no pelvic injuries and no spinal injuries. Early evidence seemed to be that he did have some head injury. Um, so he was intubated, brought to St Mary's, um, admitted to PICU, intubated, um, and remained intubated for just four days. Um, he was stable in PICU, and there was no problem with his extubation. 
So when he was extubated, he didn't have the need for a swallow assessment. That might have been the first intervention of a speech and language therapist to do a swallow assessment post-extubation. But what the speech and language therapist did get involved with, didn't get involved with integrity of swallow, that was all, did get involved with cognition. So they needed a baseline assessment for the, um, the comprehension of language and a baseline assessment for functional expressive communication. Now this assessment can take place or did take place as soon as he was awake and had some periods of alertness. But in fact you can do a basic assessment, an informal assessment, if a child's in the very acute phase and, and perhaps still on a ventilator. Um, and the assessment is either formal or informal in the early stages. Um, and it's likely to be quite broad in those early stages as well, so it'll be response to voice, response to touch, stimulus, understanding of situational commands, basic commands, attention and listening. And if it had become clear that head injury was significant, then over a period of time the assessment would have looked in much greater depth at the more complex issues around communication. You have to remember that the development of our speech and language is so complex that impairment can impact on a variety of aspects. So higher level language is around inferencing and taking things literally. Um, and my, my example of that is when you say to a child who's wriggling around, you've got ants in your pants. Now a child with higher level, um, uh, higher level damage will actually look to see if they've got ants in their pants and they'll take it literally. Now, what that means is that if you can establish that the child's got higher level damage, then the whole team then need to know how to change their strategies, how to use different words, how to get the best out of a child, and the whole team being nurses, doctors, anyone who comes in contact with a child. The other examples of complex impairment in, in, um, in language development are word finding and sentence building and vocabulary. And of course you've got to take that in the context of the age of the child and the developmental stage that their speech is at. It's probably useful to remember that when we talk to young children we use a lot of accompanying language. So uh, when a mother's dressing a child or a young baby likely to say where's your head gone, let's find those toes, those sorts of words are called accompanying language child with damage to their, to their language ability and their comprehension ability can't take on board accompanying language. You need to simplify it right down. You need to think, how many doing words have you got in your sentence that you're using for them? And simplify it right down so they don't have to unravel and absorb the complexity of language. So the sorts of strategies that speech and language therapists are likely to use are reducing language levels, using signs and gestures to support spoken language, using pictures and symbols, ideas of how in the absence of speech a child could gain attention, types of question to ask to get appropriate communication, open questions, closed questions, often choices, and pain charts. In an ITU situation or, or an HDU or acute children's wards, um, the speech and language therapist will be the first person who assesses with a child who's got really quite profound dam damage whether the only way that they can gain attention is perhaps blinking. They'll be the people who decide or who at least advise on whether Blinking is appropriate, an appropriate level of understanding, whether there are any other hand gestures they can use, whether nodding is appropriate, what level of speech they're likely to regain, and what level of augmentative communication they might need. So children with severe problems might need functional communication systems, alternative and augmentative systems, and they might be low-tech systems, high-tech, signboards, picture charts, voice output aids, electronic switching, all the things that might enable them to, to communicate and convey personal needs when they want to drink. 
when they're thirsty, when they want food, whether they want to see a visitor or whether not. Let's go back to Nabil, who's the case study. So by the time the physiotherapist got involved, Nabil had been, well, they hadn't needed to see him when he was in PICU. He didn't have any, any respiratory problems. He was, um, he was out of PICU and onto the wards. He'd been back to theatre several times because it was a mucky wound. He'd, he'd been thrown from a coach and found um, in the... In the um, the muddy bank, I think. So the wound needed some debridement. There was a lot of lavage of the stumps needed, diaphragm of the nerves, tying of major blood vessels. And this, these trips back to, to, to theatre were probably taking up to four weeks following the injury. Um, and the main task for us as physiotherapists was to help him regain motor function. Because he did what we would have expected. He held left arm flexed at the elbow, held his knee in flexion, those sort of protective postures. And we needed to make sure that we could maintain his range of movement in his elbow and his shoulder, because he was going to need that for later on. And most importantly, maintain muscle power and range of movement in his lower limb in preparation for having an artificial limb. And he didn't like limbs being held, he didn't like them being touched, well that wasn't surprising either. Um, and that's an important stage to overcome. So physiotherapy concentrated on lots of normal activities, playing on the floor, playing and kneeling. And you can imagine playing and kneeling was a very peculiar sensation for him. Kneeling without having any that extra weight of your lower limb destroys your balance dramatically. So we needed to take things fairly gradually to get him to balance on one leg, to be used to propping with a stump, in order to be able to play, to play two-handedly, to actually use that stump arm for, for throwing, patting, catching balls, holding toys. The problem with his balance was that children who are aged between four and six have this normal period of disequilibrium. So they're often, where they've actually acquired balance skills, they're hopping, they're running, they have a period of about two years when they seem to be much less balanced and we caught him in that period as well. So his balance wasn't very sophisticated anyway and we know that between five and seven is when children get better at their running, hopping, jumping, velocity, cadence, all of those things that develop into a mature gait that comes at around the age of eight. Fortunately, he was five and he had already learned to hop. Had he been three and he hadn't learned to hop, we would have had far greater problems. Because he only had one hand and a stump, he wasn't able straight away to use a rollator. A rollator would have been the first first choice in order to get him moving. So there was a lot of ingenuity to create something that enabled him to put his hand so that he could be his arm, so he could be still holding on to a rollator. We used a rollator that's a, a cable, a backward rollator. And, and the reason behind that really is that then when you get closer to whatever you're getting to, the piece of equipment isn't in the way. You, you're there able to lean against the table and play. Equally, hopping was quite tiring for him, so it meant that he could have a little rest on it when he was, when he was tired. Um, it was also clear that he would need a wheelchair, um, because although he got, um, we were hoping that he was going to get very good mobility with an artificial limb, he was going to need a wheelchair because artificial limbs break, they need to be repaired, you get skin breakdown. There are bound to be times when he wouldn't need one. But a child with a lower limb amputation was always going to get good mobility. Think Heather Mills, Heather McCartney in Dancing on Ice. You know, He was going to be active and mobile. An artificial upper limb is altogether different. Children hate artificial upper limbs. They really can't be doing faffing around with something that just plain doesn't do what they want it to do. So they're much rather manage with a stump, fix with it, hold with it, do whatever. But what you do need to do is maintain the integrity of elbow and shoulder. 
because artificial limbs are quite sophisticated and the chances are in adulthood he might want to use something. Um, there, there are such good things in, in existence that enable fine motor function with upper limbs that you'd have to assume that he might want to do that later. But children really, really do hate them. So by the time he was ready for discharge from us, he could get around the ward in a toy car, he could help with propelling a wheelchair, he could play safely in standing, and he could get in and out of bed with hardly any assistance. He could hop sideways when he was playing at a table, and he could walk with his walker for, for short distances, nothing too dramatic. And his first limb fitting appointment was scheduled for two months after his original injury and by which time he'd been discharged from us and his care continued into the community. So the key message from a physiotherapy point of view is that growing children have particular needs in order to maintain joint integrity, soft tissue structures. Splinting is often delayed with adults. When, when you have an adult with a, a, um, a traumatic amputation, invariably you won't rush to splint them. Um, and, and the uh, the adult teens never really think about splinting, but children it's so much more important. Um, and so that sh the message is that that should never be delayed, despite the fact that the changing picture means that you have to re-splint several times. So physiotherapy is involved from a and to discharge, and it might include PICU, although in this instance it didn't. It's likely to include bedside and gym-based rehab. Occupational therapist practice is based on children shaping and being shaped by their experiences and their interaction with the environment. So they work with children to enable them to access the environment. And that's to say play, learning, self-help skills, personal care, school and other activities of daily living. So their involvement in the bill was around task analysis. How was he going to relearn the skills to dress himself with one hand? How would he play constructively when he'd got one hand and a stump? And how was he going to achieve any other two-handed activities? Now fortunately again, he was five, his handedness was established, and he was right-handed, so at least we knew he was going to be able to do right-handed dominance activities. When he was in hospital, a large part of the OT involvement was behind the scenes. Because Nabil's mother and younger sister were also injured in the accident, they'd had, their, they'd had limbs um, amputated as well. The OTs <coughs> and the adult team had been very involved. Um, and, and there'd been a lot of coordination in order to get this family together at times. Um, and, the, and the two teams were, were really involved with the discharge planning meetings to try and get them back together, sorting out home, predicting and advising on, on the adaptations required, and liaising with that whole variety of community services. Of course, it wasn't without its complications because they didn't have a home in London, their home was in Glasgow, their GP was in Glasgow, no one wanted to take responsibility for them. Um, they wanted, because, because the father was, had got his job in London, they wanted to stay and settle in London. But no local authority would take responsibility for a family that wasn't with them at the time. And until they, we were established where they were going to be live, we couldn't really decide which limiting centre to, to send them to. Were they going to go south of the river or north of the river, basically? No one, else, no one would take responsibility for funding equipment. Wheelchair service wouldn't even accept the referral because he didn't have an address in London. So everything had to be done by contacting Scotland, trying to get the GP to do things, trying to get the PCTs to come to agreements between themselves. It was so unbelievably complicated to get the family back together and discharged into the community. So the problems are equipment, who pays for what, home adaptations, and any, any referrals to a rehabilitation centre. <coughs> Not that that was relevant from the bill. So the short-term provision of, of mobility equipment 
that will enable discharge is usually the responsibility of acute services, so walking aids and occasional short-term loan of, of wheelchair. Wheelchair provision is always a big problem. Um, the criteria set by wheelchair services are rarely relevant for children and rarely applicable to the, to the rehabilitation of paediatric trauma. So, as we've already said, a young child, lower limb amputation, needs access to a wheelchair for some alternative mobility, but actually wheelchair services won't call that an essential user. So all they will provide him is basic, low-level, awful wheelchair. What you have to do is go to the charities, try and get some funding from them, try and get something that's much more acceptable for a child in the context of school, environment, family life. The other thing to take on board, the risks of not having alternative mobility if a child isn't able to walk, albeit temporarily, is their loss of independence and that psychological dependency that they then have on the family. And this was critical for this family because what she needed when she went home was some way of getting two children, both who had limb deficiencies, out and about to the shops. If you're sending a child to a rehab centre, they need the child to already have a wheelchair. They won't, most rehab centres won't accept a child who hasn't got a wheelchair. But the commissioning PCT, or the commissioning wheelchair service, won't provide a wheelchair if they think there's likely to be a change in level of, of demand, a change in level of ability. It just becomes a catch-22 situation. PCT, the PCTs normally fund the equipment in community, and schools have a responsibility to provide equipment that enables children, children to access the curriculum. And that's a nice catchphrase that you can sometimes use if you want to, we sometimes use, if we want to get specialised seating or special equipment into school. We'll say in their statement of special educational needs that they need it in order to access the curriculum. And of course local authorities and social services deal with housing adaptations and things. But all of them have considerable constraints. So they're budgetary constraints, there are time lags, um, and, and it delays everything around discharge planning. And I suppose that's why one of my key messages is that discharge planning needs to start so much earlier than, dare I say, doctors ever give it credit for. I suppose it's because doctors are so focused on medical management that they don't really want to think of the intricacies of discharge planning until they're ready for it. So it's usually nursing teams and therapy teams who are bullying that one along. In terms of equipment in the acute setting, therapy equipment for bedside use is always bulky. It's things like standing frames, tilt tables, sometimes bulky chairs. Not good for bedside um, therapy. Um, and it's not always easy to get to a therapy gym. Therapy gyms might be virtually the other end of a hospital. To my mind, a key adjacency in a trauma unit is to have some sort of therapy space. But most acute hospitals are so tight on place on space that they really won't consider that. But St Mary's is, is built on such a relatively small footprint that we haven't got a hope of getting any therapy space adjacent to the children's wards when we start having major <coughs> trauma, and especially if we call it rehabilitation. And in terms of paediatric rehabilitation centres, you'll probably know they are really few and far between. They're a very expensive resource, it's very hard to get children into them, and it's extremely hard to get a PCT to pay for them. If a PCT have any thoughts that actually the provision could be provided within their local services, that's what they're going to go for. And you really have to push very, very hard to get children into, um, into a, a rehab centre. So, what is good practice? Well, we've heard before, a child is not a small adult. Um, you'll have heard that said all morning and probably on many other occasions and what it means from our point of view is that you've got to take normal motor communication and social development into consideration team around the child 
so a cohesive team, all working towards the same purpose. The family have to trust that team. They have to know that everyone in the team is going to give them the same message. It's not that they mean to play one off against the other, but if you do give the hint that one therapist has said one thing, while the speech and language therapist or the OT has said something different, then the family lose trust. The family need to have a place in rehabilitation as well, and that's different for everyone. For some families, close parenting is all they can cope with. They really don't want to be the therapist and the teacher as well. And for other families, they're more than prepared to take that on board, to participate, to know what they've got to do to carry on therapy throughout the day. Discharge planning starts at admission, not wait until the medical problems are all resolved. And communication. There's got to be meaning, meaningful in, in communication into the receiving team. You need to be able to tell the receiving team, if you're discharging into the community, what the predicted long-term outcome is and what the parents' expectations are. It's not fair to send a child out into a different community service with the parents going with, with mixed messages. So finally, I may have oversimplified. Um, of course, good practice also means meeting standards for service delivery, emphasis on quality outcomes, um, patient user experience, provisions embedded into interagency collaboration, pathways mapped and identified, and also the key points from the Children's Charter, which is that children should be healthy, stay safe, enjoy and achieve, make a positive contribution and achieve economic well-being.